With Allagash White now available in 12 packs, no matter if your next adventure sounds like this, onward, or like this, you can count us in. Allagash Brewing Company, from Maine, with love. Must be 21 years or older. Please drink responsibly. This is a CBC podcast. Today I was uh, in my apartment uh, around 12 o'clock, and then I was uh, hearing uh, screaming and crying of the woman outside the apartment. So when my mother uh, went to the door and she saw some Taliban's were going up through the stairs, I said, lock the door and just come back. And then after that, I told my wife, can you just go and tell them, like, no one, my husband is out. No one, no man is in the, in the, in the apartment. I cannot open the door for you. And then the Taliban said in Pashto language, okay, we will not come in. They were, they were in, the, in the building for, for two hours. They took two people from the apartment, from the building where I live. Um, they were working for the governments. That's what it's like to live in Kabul, Afghanistan right now, according to a man we're calling Abdul. We've agreed not to use his real name to protect him and his family. He was speaking with the CBC's Susan Ormiston yesterday from the Afghan capital. He's since left his apartment, which is in an area known to house government staff and people who worked with foreign organizations. I'm not safe. My children, my wife is not safe here, especially my daughters. They're, they're very scared. I'm scared, you know. I couldn't sleep. Every time I feel like someone is coming behind the door and knocking and saying, uh, can you get this guy? And then he did this, 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 this for foreigners. You know, since 2001 or 2002, I've been working for different organizations and different, different media as a journalist. I have contacted maybe 50 to 60 uh, crews, organizations, NGOs that I worked for. Uh, so everybody's promising me, but uh, I hope these promise, one of the promise come on the on the real stage to I can get out of this country with my family. Abdul has worked as a freelance journalist and translator with several international organizations, including Canadian. Now he's one of many Afghans in danger under Taliban rule and one of the many hoping for help getting out. Canada has pledged to take in 20,000 Afghan refugees, but veterans and Afghan-Canadian resettlement groups are frustrated with the lack of transparency in the process. Now a volunteer humanitarian effort spearheaded by veterans and retired generals is working to help interpreters and others who worked alongside Canadians. Retired Major General Dennis Thompson is a 39-year veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces and served as a NATO commander in Kandahar in 2008-2009. General Thompson, good morning. Good morning. So what's the latest you're hearing about the situation for the Afghans that you're trying to get out of the country? Well, we have about 800 individuals, so that's not 800 interpreters, but it's their them and their families spread across Kabul in various safe houses and enduring exactly the conditions that you just heard, that, that, that you just played on the, on the radio. Um, We've told them to stay in place. When we find out that there is an aircraft on the ground for which which they are manifested, then we have a mechanism to attempt to move them to the airport. The difficulty being, of course, is they'll have to navigate a series of Taliban checkpoints. Canada resumed military flights yesterday. What will that mean for your efforts to get them out of the country? Well, that's good news, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) The connection still has to be made between uh, the airport when when the flight arrives and the individuals who are are being asked to get to the airport. Right. Uh, that journey takes varying lengths, and it's it's uh, the two Canadians that we have on the ground, the two Canadian expats who are on the ground, that are doing that assessment for us and uh, assisting and advising these families on how to make that treacherous drive. Mm-hmm. How much communication have you had with the Canadian government on resettlement of these Afghans who are at high risk and in the country? Well, it's fair to say that we've had pretty good communication with our former colleagues in uh, the Department of National Defense. Uh, Not the greatest passage of information between ourselves and uh, immigration, refugees, and um, Citizenship Canada. Um, We provided a number of... uh, of lists of names, et cetera, uh, but we don't get any feedback and we're not really sure who's actually on their vetted list, which is critical because we don't want to give out false hope to families that, that are trying to make their way here to Canada. Mm-hmm. Of the 20,000 Afghan refugees Canada has promised to bring in, many are already outside Afghanistan. What do you think of the government's priorities? 
Well, clearly that's very important to do family reuni- reunification, etc., for those uh, those that are already outside of Afghanistan, and thank goodness they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, our focus is exclusively on the 800 in Kabul and the, the other 1,200 who are trying to make their way into the capital, uh, get in one of these safe houses, and then eventually get to the airport when when a flight is available. But that window is closing rather rapidly because, as I think we all appreciate, the coalition will leave Afghanistan by the end of the month. And when that happens, then all bets are off with respect to what the Taliban will will inflict on those that supported the West. Mm-hmm. And how dangerous is it getting families from those safe houses to the airport? It's uh, at the moment... We are not aware of anyone that has... All of our people are accounted for. First of all, let me say that. And they're all in their safe houses. Um, To travel the streets, because we're aware of um, a UN convoy that made it to the airport to get their expats out of the country, but that convoy was escorted by the Taliban. So Mm -hmm. clearly there is some negotiation that has to occur at the lower level in order to to, um, cross all of these checkpoints. The concern is, of course, that at any one of these checkpoints, they could be pulled out and uh, and denied or denied access to the airport, and they could have their their travel documents uh, taken away. There's certainly stories of phones being uh, taken, searched for any connection with the West, and then um, you know some being summar- summarily executed. That's not uncommon, uh, but that has yet to occur to the families that we are uh, trying to guide inside of Kabul. Mm-hmm. After serving in Afghanistan, how are you feeling about what we're seeing there now? Well, obviously, I'm I'm disappointed and uh, and just as shocked as everybody else by the rapid collapse of the Afghan National Army, an army that we helped to train, um, and that uh, clearly gets under your skin. Uh, but what I like to say is to the uh, to the soldiers who may be listening to your to your show that served in Afghanistan that they they needn't. They needn't be, uh, I mean, they'll definitely be disappointed, but they needn't be hang their heads in shame because at the end of the day, they performed what we asked them to do. And Mm -hmm. professional soldiers really exist just to buy time for the policymakers to come up with a workable plan at the political level. We hung on to a very tenaciously to a very difficult province when we were uh, clearly under-resourced to do so. And every Canadian soldier that served there did so in a remarkable way fashion, and they, 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 they should be proud of their service. Major General, thanks so much for your thoughts this morning. And thank you, and thanks for keeping the issue alive. Retired Major General Dennis Thompson was NATO's commander of Task Force Kandahar. The Afghan community in Canada has been watching the situation in their home country get worse by the day, and they're paying close attention to government promises to resettle the most vulnerable. Ali Mirzad lives in Ottawa, but he was born in Afghanistan. He is Hazara, an ethnic minority group in that country. He's also an advisor to the nonprofit group Canadian Hazara Humanitarian Services. Good morning. Good morning, Nora. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. So what are you hearing from family members about the situation on the ground there right now? It's uh, terrible. Uh, I mean, first of all, the uh, communication is very scarce. I mean, we're we're only able to reach them for, for short uh, windows of time and very uh, sporadically. I have only been able to speak to my uncle, my maternal uncle, uh, Monday, Monday morning. Um, and, you know, we're today, Wednesday. I, I forgot even which day of the week we are because I've been up since Thursday night. Nice. Um and uh, everyone's scared. Uh, my uncle, you know, I have uh, him, his children. Uh, I have uh, my aunt, her children, her husband. Uh, like so many other people in our community, everyone has loved ones over there. Mm-hmm. And uh, as of Monday, when I did reach my uncle, that was the first day and the second day after the Taliban took over of the capital. And uh, he confirmed that uh, the Taliban were actually starting to go door to door. Uh, to collect names, I guess. I'm not sure. But for us, the Hazaras, who are a minority in Afghanistan, is uh, it's frightening. Yeah. Um, you know, the experience we've had with them in the past, in the 90s, where they've slaughtered uh, thousands and thousands of Hazaras and committed genocidal crimes against us in the Mazar Sharif and Bamiyan provinces. Uh, people are still living with the trauma of mm-hmm. that experience, and now uh, they're back, and we're just 
people are stuck there. So what have you been doing to help secure travel arrangements for, for family and other members of the Hazara community? Well, uh, that's a good question, Nora. I mean, uh, the, we were we commend, we applaud, and uh, we're immensely grateful for Canada stepping up and the uh, announcement that the uh, uh, minister and the government made for relocating people. However, um, the program itself uh, is still not finalized. I mean, as of this morning, if you go on Immigration Canada's website, it still says that the detail for relocating those 20,000 people is still unclear. Um, and there was some hopes when the embassies were still open and the airport was still open. However, now that that's closed and the details of the 20,000 people being relocated is also not clear, uh, we're hopeless. Uh, to be more specific, and if I may just add this, mm-hmm. um, the Hazara community here in Canada, uh, we've made our case before the Canadian Senate on November 26, 2016. Uh, we made our case in front of the House of Commons on December 6, 2018. And then we subsequently uh, presented our case to the Parliament, uh, to the House of Commons of Canada on June 22, to the Human Rights Subcommittee. Uh, interestingly, in June 22, just this past June, uh, when we presented our case to the uh, Human Rights Subcommittee of Parliament, uh, there was another organization. I mean, the meeting in that session was under the premise of the uh, persecuted minorities of Afghanistan, mm-hmm. and it presents it, an opportunity for the Hazaras, as well as the Sikh and the Hindu community, to present their, their case. Uh, the Manmeet Singh Bular Foundation was as well there. Now, the announcement that the minister made uh, regarding this uh, relocating of resettlement of the 20,000 people only mentions the LGBTQ and the uh, Hindu and Sikh community, as well as the Men Meet Singh Buller Foundation. It has no mention of the Hazaras, and that, for us, is deeply disappointing. And uh, concern, it concerns us, and concern it's concerning. Excuse me, uh, because we feel that we have been left out um, of this entire resettlement project. And uh, our organization, the one that I volunteer with, uh, the Canadian Hazara Humanitarian Services, we have been flooded with cries of help from the Hazara community in Afghanistan, as well as Hazara Canadians here trying to help their relative, uh, asking questions about how they can help, how they can be able to to get out. Uh, I think we've all seen the desperation of people trying to get out, uh, hanging on to that B-52 plane. Uh, That's the state of uh, mind that people are in in Afghanistan. Everyone is desperately trying to get out. Uh, We, again, I I wanted to emphasize and underline again that we're immensely grateful for Canada stepping up and the world and the international community, but we just want to make sure that the Hazaras are not forgotten. Uh, The crimes committed against the Hazaras is well documented. Uh, We know what's waiting for us. So I only wanted to finish in closing by saying that uh, that we should, as Canadians and the Canadian government, I urge them to follow the footsteps of the retired General Romeo Dallaire by saving the Hazaras swiftly in order to avoid another Rwanda unfolding before our eyes. Ali, thanks so much for your insights this morning. Thank you. Ali Mirzad is an advisor to Canadian Hazara Humanitarian Services. He joined us from Ottawa. Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live-streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device slash service required. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. With Allagash White now available in 12 packs, no matter if your next adventure sounds like this... Onward! Or like this... You can count us in. Allagash Brewing Company. From Maine, with love. Must be 21 years or older. Please drink responsibly. I'm joined next by Canada's Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Marco Mendicino. Hello. Yes, good morning, Nora. So what's the latest you can tell us about Canadian flights to bring people out of Afghanistan? Well, I'll come to that in just a moment, but I want to begin by acknowledging your last guest uh, and uh, that this is a difficult moment. The fear is palpable among Afghans, and we're not going to forget about the Hazars. Um, Just to that point, are the Hazars part of the resettlement plan? Can you just clarify? 
Yes, I'm going to come to that, and uh, we'll expand a little bit about that. But I also want to give you an update, as you as you just asked. Mm. Um, uh, so, so look, uh, the images at the Kabul International Airport were horrifying a couple of days ago, but I want to contrast those images with the images of our own Pearson International Airport in Toronto, where in the last two days we've received two more flights. And this brings to roughly 1,000 the total number of Afghan refugees that we've been able to evacuate, which is nothing short of miraculous given the situation. And I want to give a shout out to the members of the forces and all of Team Canada who are there. They're working in exceedingly difficult and dangerous circumstances. We're working tirelessly with our coalition partners to resume flights. We're going to keep running them for as long as possible. But after that, as you heard the general say, the retired general say, all bets are off, which is why the world needs to be ready for the humanitarian refugee crisis, which is unfolding. And this is where Canada is leading. We were the first country to launch a program to welcome up to 20,000 Afghan refugees who've fled and are in third countries, focusing on women, girls, and targeted minorities, including Hazars and Sikhs and others. And then we're going to move heaven and earth to help them. We know that there is a need. There are reports from the UN that already thousands have fled Afghanistan. And this is going to be another national moment where, like with Operation Syrian Refugee, where, like with the Vietnamese boat people, uh, we can lead and we will do so. But we just heard about the very immediate danger, as you point out, facing ethnic groups and those who, who worked with Canadians who are still inside, inside Afghanistan. Why now are resources going into bringing in Afghans who are already outside of Afghanistan? Well, first, I want to be clear with your listeners that Canada has been a safe haven for Afghan refugees for years. Uh, We stood up a a special immigration program to help interpreters and other uh, Afghans who supported the Canadian mission 10 years ago. I would point out that the program that we have put in place right now has seen a thousand evacuated. We want to evacuate more, but we also have to acknowledge that the situation on the ground is precarious Um, at any given moment in time. Um, We worry about the security of our uh, Canadian officials, and particularly the armed forces who are moving flights in and out. But we also know that there is an extraordinary demand uh, for those who have already fled, and in particular those targeted vulnerable populations, uh, women and girls, members of the LGBTQI community, as well as religious minorities. We've worked closely with a number of organizations here in Canada, and they're ready to take up the hard work of integrating those refugees. And I think this is where I I think, again, Canada can lead. You know, yesterday, I was on a call with our uh, Five Eyes Allies partners and uh, to to every single country. Uh, They pointed out how Canada has continued to show leadership in the space of humanitarian resettlement, and we're going to do so again now. But to clarify, the thousand who've arrived in the past few days, they're coming from inside Afghanistan? That's, cor- that's, that's correct, and it's not just in the last two days, to be clear. We've been running this operation now uh, for weeks, and they are coming from Kabul, uh, thanks to uh, the members of our armed forces, as well as some other arrangements with commercial flights. Uh, the point that I'm making is that we are exhausting every effort to evacuate as many people as we can, focusing on the locally engaged staff, the interpreters and Afghans who supported the Canadian mission. But I would just underline for your listeners that as the ge- retired general pointed out, um, the window for that evacuation operation will close when the coalition uh, partners uh, withdraw from Afghanistan. And that's why it's important to uh, be ready to lead on the humanitarian refugee crisis, which has already begun. And there are literally thousands who have already left Afghanistan and are trying to find themselves into third countries. They are displaced. They are vulnerable. They need a home. This is where Canada can lead. And by standing up this uh, third country resettlement operation, um, we will be able to do so with the support of vets as well as civil society who is stepping up. Why didn't Canada mobilize more and sooner to get these people at risk out, though? Well, again, as I would point out, again, uh, we've, been a, we've been a safe haven for uh, Afghan refugees for years. And you heard the retired general say uh, that the coalition uh, partners, I think, were all taken aback at how quickly uh, the situation unraveled uh, in Afghanistan and certainly the fall of Kabul which is where uh, the coalition partners remain. It's the last part of Afghanistan where there's any coalition presence, uh, is really the last remaining geographic location where we can stand up an evacuation operation. That is dangerous work. Um, As as you saw from just a couple of days ago, at at times the situation, even within the Karman Harzai International Airport, 
has been utterly chaos. Yeah, I, d- I so just want to, I don't mean to interrupt you there, but I did want to get one last question in because we're almost out of time. The retired general yes. said there are 2,000 people his group has identified who need immediate help fleeing the country. How confident are you that you can get them all out before the end of the month? Well, I'm confident that we are working uh, with veterans organizations, including the retired generals, to verify the names on those lists. Uh, he said that there was good communication with DND. DND is communicating with my department. We are working tirelessly with our coalition partners to resume flights. We'll keep running them for as long as we can. We'll get as many out as we possibly can, as safely as we can, and then we'll lead on our third country resettlement humanitarian pathway because we know there is an extraordinary demand there. There's a humanitarian refugee crisis that's unfolding, and Canadians will step up to help. Thank you very much for your insights on this. Thank you, Nora. Marco Mendicino is Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.